So hello, everyone. Welcome to the GFI Business About Protein monthly seminar. My name is Audrey Gear, and I'm a startup innovation specialist at the Good Food Institute. The Good Food Institute is an international nonprofit organization that is developing the roadmap for sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. We identify the most effective solutions, mobilize resources and talent, and empower partners across the food system to make alternative proteins accessible, affordable, and of course, delicious. Uh, please visit gfi.org to learn more about our work. Uh, before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, this seminar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. A copy of the recording will also be emailed to all of the registrants after the presentation, and you can view our pre previous seminars on our YouTube channel. Uh, secondly, this seminar will include an audience Q&A in the last 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, please ask your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat. Uh, you're welcome to ask your questions throughout the seminar but we won't be able to address them until the end. Uh, and third, immediately following the seminar, we will be hosting a virtual networking session via the Meetaway platform. Uh, we'll drop the link in the chat that will take you to the registration page where you can sign up if you haven't already. And this is just a great opportunity to meet other professionals in the alt protein industry. We'll be matched with several other people for one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, I know that I've met some fantastic people at these mixers and really encourage you all to join us. Uh, just remember, you do need to sign up via Meetaway to access the networking, and that will start about 15 minutes after this seminar ends. Uh, which brings us to today. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker, Robert Lawson. Uh, Robert will be sharing with us everything you need to think about before deciding to scale your company internationally. Robert is a managing partner and co-founder of Food Strategy Associates, which is one of Europe's leading business advisors to the food and drinks industry and a consultancy with wide experience in plant-based foods. They support plant-based companies in development of business strategy and new market entry, and they advise investors who are looking to enter the market. Robert has been involved in plant-based foods for over 25 years. He was strategy director at Linda McCartney, which is one of the most enduring brands in the market, and was the CEO of Corn Foods, which many of you are familiar with, which is still one of the largest participants worldwide in the alternative meat segment. Robert, welcome. We're so lucky to have you here today. Thank you, Audrey. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, so I guess I should start sharing a presentation and I'll try and do that. And somebody's gonna shout if it doesn't come on the screen, I hope. So can everyone see that, Audrey? We can That's all see it. Okay. So the exam question today, as I understand it, is how to internationalize my plant-based business. And I, I come at this question first and foremost as someone who's worked in the food industry rather than particularly a plant-based specialist. And I've been working in the food industry a long time and I've been internationalizing food brands for a long time. Um, I was involved in bringing Ormeos to Europe I'm not sure how well that sits with my conscience, but luckily I also took McVitie's, to, McVitie's Digestive to Asia, and that sits much more easily. But, but um, in the plant-based world, um, I, I launched corn in Australia, in Denmark, and in Norway, and helped to establish it in the USA. And as I've worked in the food sector consulting for the last 10 years, I've seen many successes and failures in food generally, and specifically in plant plant-based foods. So let's um, see if I can turn pages on my presentation. That's proving challenging right now. Here we go. Um, there are many reasons to internationalize um, and they all apparently seem very good. And I understand that the audience here is very diverse. Some of you are coming from uh, uh, being based in very large company, uh, countries, so internationalization means going into smaller countries, and some of you may be located in small countries, in which case internationalization is essential just to get your business off the ground. Some of you are working within uh, businesses which are uh, currently or planning to make consumer products, and others are selling ingredients which supply those. So, it's difficult for me to try and address all the situations that you may be facing. But 
suffice it, suffice it to say, there are lots of good reasons why one might want to internationalize. And essentially, growing faster, achieving scale, increasing business value are all on the face of it very good reasons, as of course is it's exciting. Um, uh, uh, perhaps a less good reason is I had a call from someone overseas, so I thought I'd try and sell internationally. So lots of reasons, but um, ultimately, I think um, uh, we have to ask ourselves before we say um, how we're going to internationalize. I think it's important to address a fundamental question, which is, is my market open to internationalization? And I feel this fundamental question is not always addressed. Um, and it's a, it's a question which in my view, many companies assume the answer is yes. And actually the answer is no or yes, but it's going to be really difficult. To answer the first question, I want to share with you a bit of data first. Um, uh, and we're going to look at two markets, plant-based milk, and plant-based meat alternatives. And um, uh, I think it's worth saying that um, there are no global players in either. Um, although uh, Danone comes closest to being a global competitor, owning um, Alpro and Silk, um, uh, arguably Danone comes closest to being a global player in plant-based milks, but in plant-based meats, it's a slightly different story. And what is, let me first of all orientate you around this chart. This is not looking at the whole world. It's looking at North America and Western Europe. And along the top, you can see countries and the width of the bar represents the size of the country in that market. And then you can see um, lined up uh, horizontally stacked on top of each other are the market shares of the leading players in those markets. And what is striking is that there is no common color across all of these markets, there's no common leader. Now, from someone who's worked in biscuits, I can tell you that if you drew this map for biscuits, you'd see that Nabisco is dominant in most countries in the world, not all of them, uh, but, but most of them. And in fact, the Oreo brand is a major brand in pretty well every country in the world. But in plant-based milks, it's not as simple. And you see that um, Alpro and Silk with Danone are uh, present in many markets, but not market leader in every market. And Oatly also has built an international presence. Pretty well, everybody else has remained local. And if we then look at the same chart in plant-based meats and seafoods, you can see that you've got a different picture. And the difference in the picture is this, that, um, every country appears to have its own market leader. And there are almost no examples of market leaders being market leader in more than one country. In the US, uh, Morningstar Farms and the US are market leaders. In the UK, it's Quorn, the company that I used to run. In Germany, it's Rugenwald & Muller, which is a German meat business, which has moved into plant-based meat alternatives very successfully. In, uh, in, in France, it's Nestle, but it's a different player in every market. And, uh, and the question then becomes, well, why is that? And my thesis is that it's much easier to internationalize plant-based milk than plant-based meat. And whatever market you're in, whether you're in plant-based meat or plant-based milk or in uh, cellular or microproteins or, um, in uh, uh, egg alternatives, you need to ask yourself the question, is my market open to internationalization? And we can see in a sense um, that, um, that Alpro has had a much more successful journey of internationalizing than Quorn has. Both markets began internationalizing in the 1990s. Alpro is market leader in, in a, a number of countries, quite a large number of countries, and Corn is market leader in the UK and Ireland, and uh, not many other places, arguably none at all. So why is that? And um, I would argue that the answer is intrinsically, milk is used 
in similar applications the world over. It's used as, an, uh, as something that you add to a hot beverage and it's something that you add to cereal. And because the applications are similar across those uh, across multiple markets, it lends itself to being an international uh, brand and product. Now, one could argue, and, and in fact it is the case, that there are important local differences. And if you look at the ingredient list of plant-based milks in Germany versus the US versus the UK versus Italy, you will find important differences in the ingredient set but the fundamentals of the ingredient set are the same and the packaging formats are the same and the applications are the same. But meat alternatives, well, that's a lot more complicated. And it's complicated because we're talking about the center of the plate and the center of the plate is where cultures express themselves. And as you look at dishes consumed in different countries, these vary enormously by country. In the, in, in, and if you look at the food industry as a whole, it's difficult to think of a single multinational brand that sits in the center of the plate. And I've been thinking about this for a long time. And one, one name that comes up occasionally is, is Bird's Eye Igloo, which operates in many countries. And, in, and indeed it does. And it does also occupy the center of the plate. But actually, that brand offers a completely different range of products in different in every country it operates in, with the exception of frozen vegetables. So the brand positioning is common, but the product range is very different. So it's difficult to find uh, businesses and brands uh, here where um, uh, where there's a com uh, uh, where there's a commonality. And at the heart of this idea is that there is no such thing as a global sausage. You know, Nestle and Corn and Beyond Meat launch their sausages or their burgers in multiple markets. But in the case of sausages, it doesn't really work. There's no way that someone in the UK is going to eat the same sausage as someone in Germany. And someone in Germany is going to uh, be put off by a sausage from China. And in China, they're not going to eat a Tuscan sausage. Companies which are trying to push products internationally really need to think about whether their product is an international product. And certainly my own experience when I launched burgers from the UK into the US was that burger is not a global product that we needed really to specialize and tailor the product to the US market. Beyond Meat is arguably a case in point. Um, of, and of course, in, in the success it's experienced in the US has been quite burger centric. But as you think about an internationalization strategy, how important is burger? Well, in today's market for plant-based foods, which are um, spread across North America and Europe, um, uh, Europe, uh, Europe in Europe, the burger is not that important. In the US, it is important. So Beyond Meat successfully launches burgers in the US. To the extent it's successful with burgers in Europe and the, and the rest of the world, it, it's only important if burgers are an important part of the market. So if Beyond Meat asserts that it wants to be a global leader in plant-based meat alternatives, then it needs to be a lot more than a burger business. And to be fair to, to Beyond Meat, that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're building partnerships with a number of businesses to put its ingredient into wider applications. And so um, uh, uh, what this begs the question is, you know, what, what, um, what, what the, the question this begs is, can I win with an international strategy? How do I, how do I avoid a losing strategy of let's call it sausage imperialism. And it also begs the question, should I internationalize my business at all? Because a sausage isn't just a sausage. Every country has its own sausage. If I want to sell sausages to the French, then I'd better understand what sausages they eat. Merguez, Andouillette, Boudin Blanc. 
and the meat type to replicate could be lamb or pork heart or even pork blood. But if I want to sell sausages in the UK, it's almost certainly pork meat and it's got to have a spice blend, which is uh, reflective of a Lincolnshire sausage and so on and so forth. It's not even that you can look at a country and go, what sausage do they eat? You often have to look more regionally than that and say, what sausage do they eat in a region? But it's even more complicated than that because there's plenty of evidence in the plant-based world that what works is not simply replicating the taste and the texture. You've also got to replicate the way the product looks on shelf. And so if you go to Germany and buy Frankfurters, you may well find them in a jar in the ambient shelf. So if you want to be big in plant-based sausages in Germany, you, you need to launch sausages in an ambient format to a German taste and texture uh, in a jar. And that's exactly what Rugen, Wald and Muller have done. And uh, those, uh, there's evidence across various different product formats that replicating the packaging format really matters. And also the language. Uh, not just the you know, pick your language, it's I'm German in, in Germany, obviously, but you've got to replicate the, 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 the look and language and feel that you see on the meat-based product so that consumers who are flexitarians typically know what they're doing with the product that they're buying. So should I internationalize? Well, the first question I would ask is, have I really um, got myself into a comfortable position in my domestic market? And if I have, then internationalization may be a step to take. If I haven't, I need to be very thoughtful about it. And I need to ask myself whether my market is open to internationalization. So, if you hear all of this and go, well, that's pretty complicated, but I still want to internationalize. And, you know, I hear that the likes of Nestle find it cha cha challenging, but I'm going to go for it anyway. You've decided it's for you, um, no matter the challenges. My advice then is, what, where am I going to, to go? And what single market am I going to choose? Um, and in thinking about a single market, the emphasis is on a market and not a continent of markets. I'd like to share with you my experience of internationalization of corn. So obviously this data is a little bit out of date um, and that's, uh, that's uh, uh, yeah, I could bring, bring us up to date a little bit since then. But corn has been internationalizing its business since the, uh, the early 1990s. And of course, corn was the first microprotein player in the market and is pretty well still the only microprotein player in the market, although there are new companies uh, entering in the market currently. Um, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's great to see them enter. But corn began in the UK and launched into a range uh, of markets. And our, our, essentially our business model in the UK, which had taken us to about 80% share of the UK market, was to try and develop a corn copy of anything with meat in it. Yes, we had burgers and sausages, we had mints and we had pieces. But if the UK consumer consumed pork pies, then we would have a corn copy. We had suet puddings, we had scotch eggs, I'm sure some of you are going, what on earth is a suet pudding or a scotch egg or a cocktail sausage? Um, we copied everything. And the point is that for corn, the focus was the UK market. We understood what UK meat eaters ate and we copied it. We had deli products ready to eat. We had copies of pepperoni. We had a very broad range of product, products. We advertised on TV. And we did a huge amount of MPD led by the amazing Dr. Tim Finnegan, who's still at the business. And he was at the heart of the business model. 
But in our business, in our international business, we didn't have the resources to develop products for local countries. So we exported our UK products to Sweden and to the US, to Netherlands and to Switzerland. And we didn't have the budget to advertise in the, uh, on TV in these countries. And we didn't have a sales force in these country, countries. And we relied on distributors and agents. So we weren't replicating the successful business model of the UK. International sales peaked at around 20% of total sales, and we kept on launching in new markets. Yes, that model led to additional sales, but not to strategic security. In the noughties, we were market leaders in the Netherlands. In the chart I showed you a few moments ago, corn is barely present in the Netherlands, because in the meantime, new competitors, local competitors, Valles and Vivera, enter the market, develop products tailored to local consumers, dealt directly with retailers, and ate our lunch. So I'd like to show you a different model. Um, and the model is, uh, I'd love it to be from the plant-based meat sector. Uh, it isn't. It's from a plant-based business, but not one which um, we focus on as being plant-based. It's from a business called Mont Blanc Matern. And it's a French business, um, which makes fruit puree pouches. It started in France a little over 15 years ago, originating out of a jam business. And in its domestic market, it launched this new snack format of fruit puree in a pouch. It marketed it, it well. It targeted against a specific French consumer occasion and audience. And hey, presto, it worked. It followed the rules of how you operate an, an international, uh, how you operate a branded business. When it came to internationalization, it took an approach quite different to the one that I had taken at Corn. It said, if we're going to succeed, we have to replicate our business model. And if we do that, we can only do it in one market. So they picked a market, a single market, and said it has to work here. They launched in the US, they invested in local manufacturing almost before they had launched. They advertised in the US as if it was their only market. And perhaps most interesting of all, their CEO moved to the US to oversee the launch. They were totally committed to internationalization, but they treated the new market as their domestic market. Today, France is much less than half the business. Business value was transformed by this strategy, and there's probably papers and articles written about how unbelievably successful the founders of that business have been, because they kept a share in the business as it grew and grew and grew, and they've become incredibly wealthy as a consequence. And they're great guys, and I don't begrudge them a penny of it. But it is perhaps the most important lesson around internationalization. If you want to be, if you want to win be local. If you aren't local, do everything you can to make yourself as local as possible. And so if you're going to focus on one market, the first challenge you have is to pick that market. And uh, make sure that it's a market that matters. Sorry, Luxembourg, it's not Luxembourg, a market where you can be relevant, a market where you can win and not the market you first thought of or the first inquiry you received. So pick a market um, that, uh, that you're going to really invest in. And um, uh, uh, rather than the strategy of corn to post your flag in as many countries as possible. So how do you pick that market? Well, there is no simple answer. You just need to do a lot of research. Um, uh, you need to look at the size of the market and the trends for the opportunity. You need to understand the consumer. You need to look at the retail landscape, the competitive landscape, the local supply chain. You need to understand the regulations. Can I even launch my product? Will it accept my product in that market? What is the local culture and will it accept my kind of product? How do I tailor my product to make it work for that country? Are there partners I can reach out to in that market to help me develop the business? Are there government incentives in that market? There's no shortcuts. You've got to research a number of markets and pick one. I notice 
with interest a lot of yeah you know, i i had a i recall a call i received a few months ago from an australian plant-based meat company which said it wanted to launch in the uk successful australian meat alternative company no names need be given why do you want to launch in the uk i said well because we've got a great burger well that's a really bad reason for launching in the UK because there are already great burgers in the market. We've got great domestic burgers. We've got great burgers from Nestle. We've got great burgers from Beyond Meat. And we've got great burgers made by local established players. It's the most competitive sector of the UK market. And the UK market is probably the most competitive sector of the meat alternatives market overall. It's certainly the lowest price market uh, that I'm aware of. So think carefully about uh, which market you're going to go into. I want to sort of drop into a few, a few specifics here. Do some consumer research. So often uh, we work with companies who are already in a market and they haven't uh, taking the time and effort to do consumer insight. It's going to be incredibly informative to you. Here's um, some research that we did recently. Um, I say recently, it's a couple of years out of date now on um, dairy, dairy free products, specifically plant based cheeses and consumer motivations. And we did it across three different countries. Um, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's a type of research called a U and A study, a usage and attitude study, which researches fundamental motivators behind why consumers do and don't eat the products that are, that are under examination. It's also a kind of research that can help you test brands and product concepts. It turns out Americans don't care about animal welfare as much as Germans do. Does it matter? Yes, this matters. It tells you how to position your brand. It tells you how to formulate your products. Um, and as you test products under this kind of research, you'll see that some concepts will work and some don't. And it's a starting point before you spend a lot of money in launching a product. Typically a UNA study would cost about $20,000 per market that you cover. And that might seem a lot of money, but if you think about what the listing fees might be if you launched, say, in Germany, you'd be spending 10 times that amount on listing fees. And so you want to make sure that, um, that you're spending your money well before, before you do that. Also examine the retailer landscape. The route to market and the retailer landscape can vary enormously from one country to another. And I've used as examples here the UK and Germany, both European markets. In the UK, you've got central buying. You only need to see one person in Tesco to launch your product. The Tesco buyer counts for over 30% of the market. If you go to the Edeka buyer in Germany, you'll first of all find that there's an Edeka North and an Edeka South and an Edeka East and West. But if you go to the Edeka North buyer and he says, I'll list your product, you'll find that your product isn't listed until you've gone to a whole load of store managers to get them to buy the product from the list. In the UK, you're typically living with uh, chilled shelf life expectations of 10 to 30 days. In Germany, it might be 40 to 90 days. That points to completely different preservation processes. If you're supplying own label into the UK, you're going to find that the retailer will insist on doing a technical audit of your facility at zero notice, which is quite scary. Although once you pass that technical audit, you are really in shape. In Germany, retailers don't do tech audits. In the UK, there aren't listing fees. In Germany, there are significant listing fees. In the UK, there is a private label role in mainstream retail. In Germany, hard discounters control over 50% of the market and are substantially only private label. In the UK, in-store promotions are key. In Germany, you have to do coupon marketing. It's key to, to selling your brand and getting rate of sale up. My point is you have to do a lot of research at the retail landscape level.
And of course, I'd suggest that you research every aspect of the business model and go to market strategy before you internationalize. These are decisions you live with for a long time, so best to do the research up front. So ask yourself, before you internationalize, do I have a right to win? Because there's a whole series of reasons why you won't win an international market. So if you think that internationalization is a hobby, you're lost. If you think that your product is tailored for a different market to the one that you're targeting, you're not gonna win. A product that isn't as good as the local product, you're not gonna win. A price that is out of kilter with local prices ain't gonna win. A distributor serving your business when local players have their own sales force, you're not gonna win. Spending less on branding and promotion and marketing, you're not gonna win. You've gotta give yourselves reasons to win. But get it right, and the opportunities are phenomenal, as we saw with the case study from Mont Blanc Matin. If you establish that internationalization is the right strategy for your business, screen your markets, select one, one that matters, build an in-depth understanding of the target market, the consumer, the competitive landscape, the segmentation, drivers of growth, retail landscape, regulatory, and so on. Develop a detailed go-to-market strategy. And then you'll find that the market can become yours because so many of the competition are not focusing on what it takes to be a really great local competitor. And you have the opportunity to win in those circumstances. Thank you. Thanks so much for that great presentation, Robert. We're, uh, we're now going to shift into the Q&A portion of today. So if anyone in the audience has questions, uh, please be sure to ask it via the Q&A box and we'll do our best to, to get to all of them. Um, you know, to, to kick us off today, the Robert, uh, as, as a startup begins to think about entering new markets, how should they be thinking about their team? You know, you had this example of a CEO moving abroad when they were internationalizing, but could you talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of a centralized business structure versus a decentralized structure for companies as they expand internationally? I, I am a firm believer in, um, in having a significant amount of local influence and local shaping. Um, in your business structure. Now, my point at the beginning is you need to think about what your market is and how much local input I need and what kind of local input it is. So if I'm an ingredients business and I, I'm selling, let's say, uh, cell-based meat, cell-based pork, do I need local input to tailor my product for local markets? And the answer is yes, but it's not as much as if I was um, a, um, if I'm a Beyond Meat. So the structure and how centralized you are, there is no single answer. You need to think about what your business is and what your market is. And I think that is key. There's always a need for local input. The question is the balance of central versus local is driven by markets. There's no single answer. Got it. Um... So, so, so that makes sense. Uh, and, and I guess kind of the second question there, um, and, and maybe it depends on, on the market, but would there be any certain roles or responsibilities that are best suited for local talent as they expand? Um, or is it really just dependent? Well, let's distinguish between um, uh, businesses which are making products which are ready for consumers and those which are making ingredients. and I am more an expert in, um, in the latter than the former. But if I was, a, um, if I was a, uh, selling products to retailers, then I would need on the ground somebody who can interface directly with the retailers and someone who can understand the consumer. I also think that there's a need to have some local production because my thesis is 
that you need to tell your products locally. Now, you might be able to do that from a central manufacturing facility. In the case of plant-based milk, that could make sense. But in the case of plant-based milk, meat, it's not obvious that there is a single product, not even mints or pieces, where you don't need a degree of local tailoring of product if you want to be successful in the market. Great. And okay, we have so many questions. Um, thank you everyone for entering them into the Q&A. Uh, so what are the best sources of data for building a consumer profile, researching local markets, understanding local regulations? How do you go about actually doing this analysis? Well, it takes a lot of resource. And there are, um, uh, in terms of understanding local, local markets and local consumers, we as a firm uh, like to use uh, scan data, market scan data. And for those who aren't familiar with that, that is the data which comes straight from the tills when you buy something in a checkout. It's, it's, it's collected centrally and it gives incredibly accurate picture of what is being sold by SKU, Stock Keeping Unit, um, by, um, for the market. So you get incredibly accurate detailed information, but it can be quite expensive. In, in the US, it's called SPINS data. Um, and it would typically cost uh, 10,000 uh, sterling or more per country that you're, you're looking to buy it in. We would also often advocate buying what's called panel data, which is slightly different data, but it tells you how consumers change their behavior over time as individual consumers and what their switching patterns are. So it gives you a great insight. We'd also encourage businesses to run consumer research and to do that consumer research, typically using an online usage and attitude survey. So these are sort of three basic elements of the toolkit that we recommend to our clients when they're looking at entering a market. In terms of regulatory information, I, this was a question, Audrey, which came up when we first started talking about this, this discussion. There is a plethora of regulation. It is not simply the stuff that the plant-based meat folk are focused on. So obviously, if you're a microprotein or a cell-based meat, you're thinking about the regulation of novel foods approval and whether I need to get that approval. But there's also lots of other regulations in the market which companies need to be aware of. So lots of countries in Europe have different rules about high fat salt sugar foods and what you can advertise and what you can promote and how you label. There's lots of rules in some countries about, um, about pricing and whether you're able to discount price. And there can, be, uh, there can be complex labor rules, complex regulations. All I'm saying here is probably there's a huge amount of work. And there's a huge amount of knowledge. And that, again, points to, well, do it for one market rather than lots of markets and make sure you ace it because it's complicated. Indeed. And, and I do just want to say uh, that GFI, in particular in the United States, has quite a bit of consumer data and spins data that we publish on our website. So I really encourage you to go and check that out for anyone who, who hasn't taken a look at that already. Um, moving on to our, our next question here. Uh, someone's asking what your viewpoint is on alternative seafood and fish. Um, they are considering scaling a smoked salmon offering into foreign markets and would love your input. Uh, this just reminds me of, of you mentioning, you know, the center of plate is where cultures express themselves but does that hold true for fish or these other kinds of smoked salmon products? So fish absolutely is a center plate product. And if you've got a great smoked salmon, um, that's great. I haven't tasted a great plant-based smoked salmon. I'd look forward to trying that. Pick a market. You know, the UK, Norway, big markets for smoked salmon, big producers of smoked salmon, uh, very open to plant-based foods. You know, why not go for one of those, those markets where there's already a culture of smoked salmon and uh, of eating smoked salmon, and there's already a culture of eating a lot of plant-based foods? Thank you. 
And so uh, our next one, if a company is a startup, at what stage do you recommend that they internationalize? Is there an ideal mode of entry? Well, I'd recommend wait till you're a couple of hundred million. Um, uh, but, but that doesn't work if you're stuck in, if your domestic market is mortar. You know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a practical recommendation, but, but take the spirit of what I'm saying to heart rather than the, 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 the precise numbers. I often, so I, I was at a startup a few weeks ago. It's uh, got a sub a million dollars, but it's already selling overseas. Why are you guys selling overseas? I said, well, someone asked us. Well, what kind of an answer is that? It's no kind of an answer at all. Someone asked us. And how much time is it taking? Oh, not too much time. But we've got a different brand on that product and it's got a different shelf life and it's manufactured in a different way. And why haven't you sold more in the U UK, uh, which is the market it's based in? Well, we haven't had time to develop the UK. And it's kind of, listen, you're years away from needing to think about international. You've done it for short-term need. It hasn't addressed the short-term need because it's small and it's distracting. And so the story is from last week, but it's a story I hear again and again and again. The companies uh, are excited by the international opportunity. They get an inbound inquiry. They're tempted by it. It's seductive and it's a distraction. And it, it's a distraction from securing the distribution that you need for your core business in your core country. Got it, got it. Um, and so maybe this is touches upon the, this next question, which is um, comparing expanding to more European markets as compared to other much bigger markets such as the US and, and, and how do you weigh the different sizes as compared to, to other factors? It looks like this company is thinking about um, their German brand thinking about going to France versus the US. Um, they both have pros and cons, how you might think about approaching that. Well, listen, I think it's important to, um, to go to, uh, if you're in one market and you want to go to a second market, it's important to make sure that second market matters. And in a sense, I'm saying that because of the, the experience I had at Corn, where we were in the UK and Ireland, and then we went to a whole host of smaller European countries, but we avoided the big countries. We avoided Germany and, and France for a number of years. Um, and we worked in the US, but we didn't make it work in the US. And when we came to try and sell the business at various points in time, uh, and actually I was on the buy side by that point of time, um, your buyers were saying, well, it's not really proven itself internationally. And it hadn't. It hadn't proven itself because it was successful in smaller markets and, it, and in the big markets it hadn't worked. Whereas that question was, would never have been raised on my case study of Mont Blanc Matern. If you're in Germany, yeah, France is a, another big market, it matters. So if you go to one market, go to France or go to the US. Don't try and do both. Um, uh, make one of them work, but don't go to Austria. I, I don't mean never go to Austria, that's a disaster. My point is it doesn't prove anything and it doesn't change the kind of trajectory of your business. Thank you. And uh, here's our, 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 another question. For an important player in other industries like finance and retail um, that want to enter the plant-based meat market, what would the rational path forward be? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you try um, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like this could be a uh, like a large retailer or um, a large you know financial institution. They want to start getting involved in, in plant based meat, um, maybe internationally. Where would where where should they start? Um, they should. Um, well, I. Starting with a blank sheet of paper is tough. And we speak to private equity firms who want to get into plant-based foods a lot. And we look at 
financial institutions who want to get into plant-based foods a lot. There aren't many public vehicles that you can invest in. You know, there's Beyond Meat, there's Oatly, there's very little else for, um, for, public, for public funds. But if you're a private investor, a private equity investor, it's very difficult to see the valuations work for you. Um, because typically private equity investors are looking for existing cash flows and they're looking for those cash flows to be purchased at a sensible multiple and then to increase over time. The increase over time isn't necessarily a problem. It's the do cash flows exist today and are they big enough for us to make an investment? So private equity has made very limited inroads into plant based foods because the valuations don't suit their business model. And, um, and they have to look beyond the sexy to find things that work, where sexy is branded. Um, so they might look at retailer branded businesses, which tend to go for lower multiples and can be quite mature businesses. So um, I think the answer is you have to, you have to look for, for the type of business and type of industry structure which fits your financial model, but it's not straightforward. Happy to take that question offline. Thank you. So this next question, I find it really interesting. <coughs> um, and it's around the United States being a, a pretty massive market. And there's a lot of geographic uh, variation um, across the uh, across the states, across the geographies. Uh, how do you look at a market like the United States? Do you look at it as one mass market? Do you separate it into sub-markets of different states, geographies? What criteria do you consider there? So I think you, you, um, the entry strategies into North America, and you know, this is true of other very large markets like India and China too, is you, you tackle a part of the geography and you make a choice. So you're not making the choice to go into America, you're making a choice whether you're going East Coast or West Coast. You're making a choice whether you're going Mumbai or or, or Delhi, um, and um, uh, but you have a plan ultimately to spread across the entire market. But initially, you 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 your beachhead is one part of the country, not the whole of the country. Great. So this next question is a is a bit more specific. Um, so they're asking if a plant-based meat company has a portfolio of products, should all the products equally participate in local certifications? Um, they mentioned Nutri-scores or nutrition traffic lights in the UK and Germany. Uh, I'm not quite familiar with those certifications. Yeah. Um, or they're asking if consumers look for different benefits from each type of meat um, and including those scores might vary. So, yeah. A consumer, so all packs on shelf will need to have those nutritional scores. And I think it's important for brands to have fairly consistent uh, positioning. But you know, let's take, um, so, uh, but, but it's quite difficult to maintain that consistency. So if you are selling a very healthy meat alternative mint, if you want to sell a product which is, say, a breaded fillet, then by definition, that breaded fillet has more carbohydrate and more fat. And so may well fall foul of a traffic light system and the product might go from green to red. I think that's just how life is. But I think it's most important that you have a consistent brand message across the whole. And that brand message could include um, that you know the core protein is incredibly healthy and low in fat, but that doesn't mean that every single product is low in fat because some formats don't allow it. Thank you. Uh, and then the the second piece to this was beyond A and U. What are other custom pieces of consumer research that you find critical to conduct? Well. One piece of research that we conduct less frequently because it's so expensive is taste panels. And um, I recall you know, a couple of years ago running taste panels um, for a um, plant-based burger, yellow pea, into the UK market. 
um, from, um, from continental Europe. And um, taste panels typically would be, depending on the sample size, they could easily um, be five times as much as a usage and attitude survey. But this, this research was incredibly interesting. It, it essentially told us that the UK consumer was um, a, a, their taste profile on burgers wasn't just influenced by meat burgers, it was influenced by corn burgers, which had been in the market for so long. And so the taste and texture profile for a plant-based burger was inherently softer than one might have imagined it would be because corn had, had changed the norm, normal uh, perceptions. Now, the detail of that finding isn't that important. What's interesting is it was unanticipated by a bunch of us who were um, advising the client, um, despite the fact that we were deep experts in the market. So even the, our local knowledge hadn't got us there. Um, uh, it meant that significant but addressable tailoring of the product was required, and it had a real impact on what could be offered. And, and how the product was uh, and formula uh, recipe was formulated. So taste panels, really important. When you're doing taste panels, it's really important to be clear what you're tasting against. So we recently did taste panels for plant-based cheeses, and we did them against other plant-based cheeses. This was for a specific brand. We tested against other plant-based cheeses, but we also tested against dairy cheeses. And, and actually we were testing against craft cheese slices, which was the analog that everything was trying to copy. And we did the taste panels both hot and cold to replicate how people would actually eat it in different circumstances. And it proved um, incredibly interesting to see when the product performed well uh, and how well it performed um, uh, and, and, and how the competition fared. So we, we often recommend taste panels, but it's seriously expensive and needs to be done quite late in a process because if you're trying to test 20 different products, the bill will quickly come to half a million dollars. Serious amounts of money. That is serious amounts of money. Uh, for our next question here, someone's asking, when you want to build an international brand, what is the perfect balance between using your own label and white labeling? So white labeling is a US term. I assume white labeling means um, uh, retailer branding. Um, so, what is the perfect balance? Um, the perfect balance is 100% of one or 100% of the other. And anything in between is imperfect. I've worked in pure branded companies. I've worked in pure own label companies and I've worked in mixed companies. And um, there is a simplicity to the operations of the pure model that you know absolutely what you're about and what you're prepared to do and what you're not prepared to do. If you're in a pure branded company, you always put the brand first. And if you're in a pure retailer branded company, you always put the customer first. And if you're in a mixed model, you've got to constantly tear the marketing director away from the sales director. Thank you for that. So it looks like we have time for probably one more question. Uh, and, and so, you know, we've seen a lot of companies struggle with what to label their products, what, what words are they allowed to use on those labels. So someone's asking here about um, your strategy or your advice um, on using words like meat and milk on labels for, for countries that don't allow those words for plant-based products. Do you have any experience working in, in countries where, where labeling is a struggle? I think the real issue about those markets is that they have lobby groups which are determined to kill the planet. And I come back to the first question or the second question, having decided to internationalize, 
Is that a market I want to spend my time in? I think you know, the, the restrictions are fairly rare in practice um, and they can generally be got around. But um, I think uh, you know, our lobby groups, GFI included, have got to win this battle. Um, the meat industry does not own language. Um, and it mustn't be allowed to, to own language for the detriment of the planet. Great. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, thank you so much, Robert, for sharing your, your time and expertise with the GF Ideas community. It's much appreciated. Um, and as a reminder, everyone, uh, please be look out on the lookout for the post webinar email with the recording of this session and some additional resources. Uh, please be sure to check out gfi.org slash events to stay up to date with all GFI events and other industry events of interest. Our next Business of Alt Protein webinar will be taking place on March 15th. And in that, we'll be sharing new research on consumer perceptions of alternative protein ingredients and production processes. Uh, so please make sure to register for that. And one more reminder before you all hop off. Um, at 15 minutes past the hour, our networking mixer will start on Meetaway. Uh, we're leaving time for a short break here. So you have 15 minutes to grab some coffee, some tea, some lunch, um, and then please uh, hop back online for some great one-on-one -on -one conversations with other alt protein professionals. Um, I hope to see you there and thank you all for attending today.